The drive home was a bitter experience. Jimmy was sullen and very quiet. He refused to answer any question and he made no reply to any statement. Paul Brennan kept up a running chatter of pleasantries, of promises and plans for their future, and just enough grief to make it sound honest. Had Paul Brennan actually been as honest as his honey tone said he was, no one could have continued to accuse him. But no one is more difficult to fool than a child, even a normal child. Paul Brennan's protestations simply made Jimmy Holden bitter. He sat silent and unhappy in the far corner of the front seat all the way home. In his mind was a nameless threat, a dread of what would come once they were inside either inside of Paul Brennan's apartment or inside of his own home with the door locked against the outside world. But when they arrived, Paul Brennan continued his sympathetic attitude. To Jimmy it was sheer hypocrisy, he was not experienced enough to know that a person can commit an act and then convince himself that he hadn't. Jimmy, said Brennan softly, I have not the faintest notion of punishment. None whatsoever. You ruined your father's great invention. You did that because you thought it was right. Someday when you change your mind and come to believe in me, I'll ask you to replace it because I know you can. But understand me, young man, I shall not ask you until you make the first suggestion yourself. Jimmy remained silent. One more thing, said Brennan firmly. Don't try that stunt with the letter to the station agent again. It won't work twice. Not in this town nor any other for a long, long time. I made a sort of family news item out of it which hit a lot of daily papers. It'll also be in the company papers of all the railroads and bus lines, how Mr. Watts' his name at the Midland Railroad got suckered by a five-year-old running away from home. Understand? Jimmy understood but made no sign. Then in September we'll start you in school, said Brennan. This statement made no impression upon young James Holden whatsoever. He had no intention of enduring this smothering by overkindness any longer than it took him to figure out how to run away and where to run to. It was going to be a difficult thing. Cruel treatment, torture, physical harm were one thing, this act of being a deeply concerned guardian was something else. A twisted arm he could complain about, a bruise he could show, the scars of lashing would give credence to his tale. But who would listen to any complaint about too much kindness? Six months of this sort of treatment and Jimmy Holden himself would begin to believe that his parents were monsters, coldly stuffing information in the head of an infant instead of letting him grow through a normal childhood. A year, and Jimmy Holden would be recreating his father's reverberation circuit out of sheer gratitude. He'd be cajoled into signing his own death warrant. But where can a five-year-old hide? There was no appeal to the forces of law and order. They would merely pop him into a squad car and deliver him to his guardian. Law and order were out. His only chance was to lose himself in some gray hinterland where there were so many of his own age that no one could keep track of them all. Whether he would succeed was questionable. But until he tried, he wouldn't know, and Jimmy was desperate enough to try anything. He attended the funeral services with Paul Brennan. But while the pastor was invoking our Heavenly Father to accept the loving parents of Orphan James, James the son left the side of his uncle Paul Brennan, who knelt in false piety with his eyes closed. Jimmy Holden had with him only his clothing and what was left of the wad of paper money from his father's cash box still pinned to the inside of his shirt. This time Jimmy did not ride in style. Burlap sacks covered him when night fell, they dirted his clothing and the bottom of the freight car scuffed his shoes. For eighteen hours he hid in the jolting darkness, not knowing and caring less where he was going, so long as it was away. He was hungry and thirsty by the time the train first began to slow down. It was morning, somewhere. Jimmy looked furtively out of the slit at the edge of the door to see that the train was passing through a region of cottages dusted black by smoke, 
through areas of warehouse and factory, through squalor and filth and slum, and vacant lots where the spread of the blight area had been so fast that the outward improvement had not time to build. Eventually the scene changed to solid areas of railroad track, and the trains parked there thickened until he could no longer see the city through them. Ultimately the train stopped long enough for Jimmy to squeeze out through the slit at the edge of the door. The train went on and Jimmy was alone in the middle of some huge city. He walked the noisome sidewalk trying to decide what he should do next. Food was of high importance, but how could he get it without attracting attention to himself? He did not know. But finally he reasoned that a hot dog wagon would probably take cash from a youngster without asking embarrassing questions, so long as the cash wasn't anything larger than a $5 bill. He entered the next one he came to. It was dirty, the windows held several years' accumulation of cooking grease, but the aroma was terrific to a young animal who'd been without food since yesterday afternoon. The counterman did not like kids, but he put away his dislike at the sight of Jimmy's money. He grunted when Jimmy requested a dog, tossed one on the grill and went back to reading his newspaper until some inner sense told him it was cooked. Jimmy finished it still hungry and asked for another. He finished a third and washed down the whole mass with a tall glass of highly watered orange juice. The counterman took his money and was very careful about making the right change, if this dirty kid had swiped the five spot, it could be the counterman's problem of explaining to someone why he had overcharged. Jimmy's intelligence told him that countermen in a joint like this didn't expect tips, so he saved himself that hurdle. He left the place with a stomach full of food that only the indestructible stomach of a five-year-old could handle and now, fed and reasonably content, Jimmy began to seek his next point of contact. He had never been in a big city before. The sheer number of human beings that crowded the streets surpassed his expectations. The traffic was not personally terrifying, but it was so thick that Jimmy Holden wondered how people drove without colliding. He knew about traffic lights and walked with the green, staying out of trouble. He saw groups of small children playing in the streets and in the empty lots. Those not much older than himself were attending school. He paused to watch a group of children his own age trying to play baseball with a ragged tennis ball and the handle from a broom. It was a helter-skelter game that made no pattern but provided a lot of fun and screaming. He was quite bothered by a quarrel that came up, two of his own age went at one another with tiny fists flying, using words that Jimmy hadn't learned from his father's machine. He wondered how he might join them in their game. But they paid him no attention, so he didn't try. At lunchtime Jimmy consumed another collection of hot dogs. He continued to meander aimlessly through the city until school time ended, then he saw the streets and vacant lots fill with older children playing games with more pattern to them. It was a new world he watched, a world that had not been a part of his education. The information he owned was that of the school curriculum, it held nothing of the daily business of growing up. He knew the general rules of big league baseball, but the kid business of stickball did not register. He was at a complete loss. It was sheer chance and his own tremendous curiosity that led him to the edge of a small group that were busily engaged in the odd process of trying to jack up the front of a car. It wasn't a very good jack, it should have had the weight of a full adult against the handle. The kids strained and put their weight on the jack, but the handle wouldn't budge though their feet were off the ground. Here was the place where academic information would be useful and the chance for an inn. Jimmy shoved himself into the small group and said, get a longer handle. They turned on him suspiciously. What you know about it, demanded one, shoving his chin out. Get a longer handle, repeated Jimmy. Go ahead, get one. Guan. Wait, Mo. Maybe. Who's he? I'm Jimmy. Jimmy who? 
Jimmy, James. Academic information came up again. Jimmy. Like the Jimmy you use on a window. Jimmy James. Any relation to Jesse James? James Quincy Holden now told his first whopper. I, he said, am his grandson. The one called Mo turned to one of the younger ones. Get a longer handle, he said. While the younger one went for something to use as a longer handle, Mo invited Jimmy to sit on the curb. Cigarette, invited Mo. I don't smoke, said Jimmy. Sissy? Adolescent age information looking out through five-year-old Isa said Mo. Mo was about eight, maybe even nine, taller than Jimmy but no heavier. He had a longer reach, which was an advantage that Jimmy did not care to hazard. There was no sure way to establish physical superiority. Jimmy was uncertain whether any show of intellect would be welcome. No, he said. I'm no sissy. I don't like M. Mo lit a cigarette and smoked with much gesturing and flickings of ashes and spitting at a spot on the pavement. He was finished when the younger one came back with a length of water pipe that would fit over the handle of the jack. The car went up with ease. Then came the business of removing the hubcap and the struggle to loose the lug bolts. Jimmy again suggested the application of the length of pipe. The wheel came off. Come on, Jimmy, said Mo. We'll cut you in. Sure, nodded Jimmy Holden, willing to see what came next so long as it did not have anything to do with Paul Brennan. Mo trundled the car wheel down the street, steering it with practiced hands. A block down and a block around that corner. A man with a three-day growth of whiskers stopped a truck with a very dirty license plate. Mo stopped and the man jumped out of the truck long enough to heave the tire and wheel into the back. The man gave Mo a handful of change which Mo distributed among the little gang. Then he got in the truck beside the driver and waved for Jimmy to come along. What's that for? demanded the driver. He's a smarty pants, said Mo. A real good one. Who are you? Jimmy James. Whatcha do, kid? What? Mo, what did this kid sell you? You and your rusty jacks, grunted Mo. Jimmy James here told us how to put a long hunk of pipe on the handle. Jimmy James, who taught you about leverage, demanded the driver suspiciously. Jimmy Holden believed that he was in the presence of an educated man. Archimedes, he said solemnly, giving it the proper pronunciation. The driver said to Mo, think he's all right? He's smart enough. Who are your parents, kid? Jimmy Holden realized that this was a fine time to tell the truth, but properly diluted to taste. My folks are dead, he said. Who are you staying with? No one. The driver of the truck eyed him cautiously for a moment. You escaped from an orphan asylum? Aha, uh -huh, lied Jimmy. Where? Ain't saying. Wise, huh? Don't want to get sent back, said Jimmy. Got a flop? Flop? Place to sleep for the night. No. Where'd you sleep last night? Boxcar. Bindlestiff, huh, roared the man with laughter. No, sir, said Jimmy. 
I've no bindle. The man's roar of laughter stopped abruptly. You're a pretty wise kid, he said thoughtfully. I told why so, said Mo. Shut up, snapped the man. Kid, do you want to flop for the night? Sure. Okay. You're in. What's your name? asked Jimmy. You call me Jake. Short for Jacob. Air, here's the place. The place had no other name. It was a junkyard. In it were car parts, wrecks with parts undamaged, whole motors rusting in the air, axles, wheels, differential assemblies and transmissions from a thousand cars of a thousand different parentages. Hubcaps abounded in piles sorted to size and shape. Jake drove the little pickup truck into an open shed. The tire and wheel came from the back and went immediately into place on a complicated gadget. In a couple of minutes, the tire was off the wheel and the inner tube was out of the casing. Wheel, casing, and inner tube all went into three separate storage piles, 